I'm going to take one minute while you're turning to Matthew chapter 9. That may surprise you, my text tonight. If you come back tomorrow night, it'll be Matthew chapter 9. If you come back Tuesday night, it'll be Matthew chapter 9. If you come back Wednesday night, it may not be Matthew chapter 9, but we'll talk about it a lot. So uh, just give you a little warning. I'm thinking 50 years ago, a little longer than 50 years ago, I traveled with a quartet. Actually, it was a trio when this happened. And we were invited to go to a church in Canada. We were invited to go to the People's Church in Toronto, pastored by Oswald J. Smith for probably 50 years. And we were going to do a youth conference. And when we pulled up, we got out of our bus and went inside to set up our sound equipment and that kind of thing. And I stood there because my dad had told me about Oswald J. Smith. Since then, I've read everything that he ever wrote down, as much as I can find. And what a heart he had for the Canadians, as well as the world. He really is the grandfather, in many ways, of Faith Promise Missions. In the middle of the Depression, his church gave a million dollars a year to missions. When I stood and preached in that auditorium after we sang, about 3,000 seats, full of young people. His son Paul then was the pastor of the church. And I stood there, Brother Dennis, I've, I've preached as you have in a lot of churches, but there was something just standing there knowing who stood there and preached and his heart for the world. And then we saw tonight, America, you better watch. Because that's where we're headed if God doesn't do something. And he's not going to do it through social programs in Washington. He's going to do it through churches like Cherry Street Baptist Church that have a heart to reach beyond Republicans and Democrats and see people for what they are, and that is souls that need Jesus desperately. That's really what this conference is about. So I want you to look with me tonight, and I'm going to read two verses of our theme. Actually, verse 37 is your theme, but I want to read verse 37 and verse 38 tonight. Then saith he, the Lord, unto his disciples, here it is again, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. Several weeks ago, when I was putting together the messages that I'm preaching here, I was sitting in my office, and I was reading a book by an old West Virginia preacher named Carl Johnson. You've never heard of him, probably. But he was a man of God that I had a great deal of respect for. And in one of his books, he said, there's a prayer that I've learned to pray and he was an evangelist every day of my life. And here was the prayer. Lord, do things we're not used to. I want you to hear that. Lord, do things we're not used to. Say it with me, will you? Lord, do things that we're not used to. Simple, clear, concise, and definitely dangerous if you pray it and really believe it. If God ever truly began to do things in our day that we're not used to, we probably would not know how to act very well. But I believe that is exactly what God wants to do in our churches when it comes to evangelism and missions and standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know when you read the Bible that Jesus specialized in making people feel uncomfortable? Read the Gospels. I mean, you would feel a little uncomfortable if Jesus come to the temple and start throwing tables around. That'll make you feel a little uncomfortable. And we could go on and on and on how that could happen. But think about this. He told the rich young ruler, 
to sell all he had, give it to the poor, and come after him and follow him. Now, if you're rich and you're a big shot, that'll make you feel uncomfortable. And then the God of the Bible, in, spite, in addition to that, is a God that is not the status quo that we've made him. Think about this. First, he shakes us up. Then he uses us, if we're willing to be used, to shake the world. That's always been God's method. In the book of Acts, he turned the world upside down. Through who? Through missionaries, through planting churches, through doing the work of the ministry. And when God wanted to change the world, for example, he told Noah to do something that Noah had never done, build an ark and to prepare for something that he had never seen, rain. And when God, again, wanted to bring forth a great nation, he called a successful middle-aged businessman named Abraham and told him to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go where he wanted him to go. When God wanted to deliver his people, he found a man that argued with God and said, I can't talk. But he called Moses and sent Moses out to do something that Moses had never done before, and that was talk to a Pharaoh. When the Lord needed someone to hide the spies in Jericho, guess what? He got a prostitute named Rahab and used her in a mighty way. When God needed someone to take care of a giant who had a big mouth and defied God, what did he do? He got a little 17-year-old shepherd boy with a rock and took care of the giant. That's unusual. That doesn't happen every day. And when Christ wanted some men in his inner circle to choose to, choose to serve him, he chose fishermen, tax collectors, a loudmouth preacher named Peter, and on top of that, two brothers that he called the sons of thunder and told them to go and preach the gospel to every creature. I read where a, a wise man once said this truth. He said, everyone wants progress, but not many people want to change to have it. Now, we live in a world of change. And sometimes the word change has a bad connotation to it. I think churches have made changes that they shouldn't have made. But I think a lot of churches need to make some changes. And I want to be open to the Holy Spirit of God in conjunction with the Word of God for God to do at Capital City. And I pray to Cherry Street whatever he wants to do to get the main thing done. And that is to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. See, the right kind of change propels us out of our comfort zone. The right kind of change focuses us and gets us out of our ruts. Change destabilizes our routines and helps us to get in God's routine. Change challenges your priorities. Change disrupts our plans. Change causes us to ask new questions and seek new answers to old questions. Change introduces us to a whole new set of problems. Change opens the door to exciting opportunities. And change stretches us in a way we don't want to be stretched. It upsets the apple cart. It kicks us out of our recliner. It rearranges our daily schedule. And it gives us a purpose that God is honored with rather than what we want for ourselves. Jesus wasn't joking when he says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up the cross daily and follow me. So I like this quote. If you want what you've never had, you've got to do what you've never done. I want to do that again. If you want what you've never had, then you've got to do what you've never done. Most of us know the insanity of doing the same thing over and over again. But sometimes God looks down from heaven and he looks at Paul Monroe and Dennis Jennings and you and I, and he says it's time for a change. There's more to what you're doing than what you're doing that you may not even know about, but it pleases me. I think about our Lord and his earthly ministry. I think about all the different people that he tried to reach. I probably said this here. I, maybe I have, maybe I haven't. But when the Lord Jesus Christ was here in his earthly ministry, he raised three people that we know of from the dead. 
He raised a little girl, Jairus' daughter. We don't even know her first name. But the Lord found her dead at home. You know where our kids are dying today? In the home. But the Lord raised her and gave her new life. One day he was walking down the streets with a little red dot on the map called Nain. And there was a little widow lady carrying her son, teenager, to be buried who had died. You know where the Lord found the teenager? In the street. And you know what he did? In the street, he gave that teenager life again. One day Jesus went out to the cemetery because his friend Lazarus had died. You know what he did? Although Lazarus had been dead for four days, Jesus said, watch out because I'm ready to do something that only God can do. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And an adult was raised from the dead. I tell you those little simple stories because you know what? Whether it's in, in Canada, whether it is in Sierra Leone or wherever it is, people are dead in trespasses and sin, and the only way they can have life again is for Jesus to come by. And that's exactly what he wants to do. Everywhere, he wants everybody to hear the gospel so that they can be saved. He shakes us up. Then he uses us to shake the world. It's always been his method. Boy, the more I read my Bible and studied that, the more it just jumps off to of the pages of Scripture. He shakes us up to get us to move out to do what God would have us to do. Shaken out of our complacency, moved out of our materialism, awakened from our slumber, convicted of our indifference, shocked out of our lethargy, that we might become what God wants us to be. May God grant that that happens this week in this conference so that you can do more. God can use you to do more than he's ever used you before to reach this world with the gospel of Christ. Some inevitable first steps must take place if God is going to do things that we're not used to. And we take our cue and pattern from the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, you have what I believe is the most famous sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus lays out the principles of the kingdom in that, in that sermon, and then he displays his power in chapters 8 and 9. Now we're looking at chapter 9 in this conference. That's where our theme is. But here's what he does. When you read in chapters 8 and 9, before we get to the passage that we're having in our conference, he cleanses a leper, he heals a centurion's son, he heals Peter's mother-in-law, calms the sea, casts demons into swine, out of swine, I should, or into the swine, he heals a, a, a crippled, he heals a woman, he raises the dead, he gives sight to the blind, he gives speech to a mute person, and that's the background, generally speaking, of what he's talking about in verse 35. Look at verse 35. It said, And Jesus went about all the cities, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You say, why is that important? Something happened at the end of chapter 9. Because when you get to chapter 10, the disciples stopped being spectators and they became missionaries. They became missionaries. They started going out and doing the things that Jesus wanted them to do. Unusual things, but verse 1 of chapter 10 says he gave them power to be able to do that. Well, what's that all about? It's all about Verse 37, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Just let me give you two or three quick thoughts. First of all, I want to talk about a neglected flock. In verse 36, it said, When he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. I talked a lot about this this morning. 
And you can't hardly talk about missions without talking about it. I'll not talk about it as much right now. But the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to see the need. And ladies and gentlemen, there is a need like there has never been before. Close to 8 billion souls now inhabit planet Earth. Many of them have never heard the gospel once. Not one time. And unless we do what we need to do, they will never hear the gospel once. And they'll perish and spend eternity in hell, eternally separated from God. To see the crowds of the world requires something inside. And that is to see them through the eyes of our Savior. Brother Dennis, before I come up to speak, gave you the greatest verse on missions in the Bible. For God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten means one of a kind. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The world, ladies and gentlemen, is full of people who are not like us. And the first step is to understand that. I've been on a few mission trips to other countries. And I tell you what, there are some similarities to people wherever you go in the world. But there are some places you go, and I don't know about everybody else, but it grabs your heart because they're not like us in many ways. And the biggest reason many people are not like us is because they've never heard what you and I hear every Sunday. They've never had anybody come to their house and knock on the door and invite them to church and see if they have an opportunity to witness the gospel to them and see them come to know Christ as their Savior. We've got to see them. But the second thing is we've got to feel compassion. In verse 36 it says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Tomorrow night, the Lord will and I am going to preach a whole sermon on compassion. Because I don't believe you'll do missions work if you don't have compassion. I believe the two are tied together, and you cannot separate them. But when we talk about compassion, we talk about feeling something deeply. We talk about the heart. In the first century, it meant something much deeper. And lower. Sometimes we talk about a feeling in our gut about something. And in the first century, that was similar to how people felt when they had compassion about something. So Jesus said, You got to see them. You got to feel compassion for them. And you got to know their true condition. Look again at verse 36. He says, They're scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd, as sheep having no shepherd. First, they are harassed. Literally, it, 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 it's a graphic word that means literally to strip the flesh. The people were like sheep that had been ripped and skinned alive. They had been harassed and victimized by those who used them and tossed them aside. I never will forget when your pastor and John and I visited Thailand and you saw just people everywhere. And you saw people that were bound by religion, committed to lighting those candles and burning that incense at a temple. Man, I, I watched that. I, I thought, my goodness, they're, they're under such bondage and don't even know it. And they're being harassed by religion. Religion does more to send people to hell than anything in the world. And our world is being harassed by religion as well as immorality as well as crooked politicians. But people are harassed. And they need somebody that has truth that can set them free. But they're also helpless. They're cast down from a mortal wound. That's the idea there. They were wounded and left for dead. Here's what I want you to see. Until you see 
you won't feel. And until you feel, you won't know. And until you know, you'll not care. And until you care, you'll not pray. And until you pray, you'll not go. It's just that simple. The world is full of people who are wounded, who are bruised, mangled, cast down, bleeding, slowly dying. And as long as we close our eyes and never lift them up and look for the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, they'll perish, folks. It's so uncertain life has become, even more so in many ways in our culture and in our country right now. Two weeks ago, a 79-year-old lady who last year graduated from our Bible Institute she decides she wanted to learn more about the Bible, and she graduated. Every time she'd come to class, she'd bring us our meal for the evening. One of the most giving people I've ever met in my life, and she got COVID. This past Thursday, I had her funeral. You know what? A month ago, three weeks ago, Two weeks ago, she had no idea that she'd be with the Lord. I'm, not, you, you know, I don't apologize for this anymore when I preach at our church, and I, I don't think your pastor would mind me saying this. I'm way over not, I don't want to be unkind, I want to say this right, but I'm way past holding words when it comes to the fact that I may be preaching to somebody tonight that will be in eternity tomorrow. That's why you need to make sure you know the Lord. But that's why we need to tell our neighbors and our friends and get these missionaries to the field as quickly as we can because every day people die. I want you to do a little exercise with me. I want you to Take your fingers just like this, put them together. Now, y'all do this to music, but I want us to do it a different way. Just snap your finger. Let's start doing it together. Everybody? Everybody? Good. We're about through. Stop. Every time you did that three times, three people went to eternity. Two of them most likely went without ever hearing about Jesus. Do you think we need a missions conference? Do you think we need a revival in our hearts? Even if it means the right kind of change to reach more people than we've ever done before. I sat in your pastor's office this morning, and he was telling me about some of the things that y'all are going to be doing here at Cherry Street. I've... Can I tell you all a little secret? You, you don't listen just for a minute. Capital City is going to do some of those things. You know, I'm, I'm kidding with him. He doesn't care. You know why? We're in this thing for the same reason. Several, a couple of years ago, your pastor and I come back from the Philippines, and Cherry Street in Capital City bought a vehicle for a Filipino missionary so he could go to an island and start a church. Now, it would have been hard for us to do that just by ourselves because we're not a large church. But when you put two churches together that believe the same thing, you can do a lot of stuff to help a missionary do what needs to be done. Notice about this wasted harvest, will you? He said the harvest is plentiful, verse 37. Here's an encouraging truth. The harvest is plentiful. Farmers understand this better than city folk. Harvest time is what it's all about. Getting that crop in is why the farmer works so hard. That's the goal of the whole season. But can I tell you something about harvest? It doesn't last forever. Here is a sad part of what needs to be done and not being done. There's a window of time. Now, there's debate about the times of the Gentiles and prophecy. And I, I'm not here to debate that with you. But I can tell you when the times of the Gentiles 
is going to end. It's going to end when the rapture takes place. Can I tell you when the greatest opportunity for missions is going to end? It could end tonight. Because the trump of God should, could sound, the dead in Christ could be raised first, and those of us which are alive and remain would be with the Lord. Now, we're to comfort one another with those words, but those, there's no comfort if you're left behind. There's no comfort if you didn't hear about Jesus, why there was an opportunity. The, the, the thing that missions is about, the urgency of it, is it doesn't last forever. What did Jesus mean when he said, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few? I think he meant there's more people than what we believe are ready. But there's a problem, and it's in verse 38. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to do what? Send forth labors into the harvest. People hurting, people suffering, and here's the whole application. The fields are already widened to harvest. The lost people are everywhere. They're everywhere in Canada. They're everywhere in China. They're everywhere with every missionary that's represented in Japan. Everywhere there are people that need Jesus. And we ought to think about that. I think this week, I follow in the mission's office the news that's going on, and I know at least two, maybe three missionaries this week went to be with the Lord. Brother Dennis, who's going to take their place? They're dying. I think John told me the average age of the average missionary down in the fellowship is 54. I talk to other mission groups. They're saying the same thing. They're saying the same thing. The harvest is plenteous. But not many people are signing up to be laborers. And if I could say one thing I wish would grab your heart and my heart more than it's ever done before, is God during this conference wake somebody up, shake somebody up, and throw them out into the harvest. Because it's past time. It's past time. Welch poet David White said it this way. I don't want to have written on my tombstone when finally people struggle through the weeds and the grass to pull back the moss and read the inscription on my tombstone. I don't want my tombstone to say he made his car payments. I don't want that. I don't even want to say he was a church member. I wanted to say he loved Jesus enough to tell somebody else about it. That's what I want. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. That was kind of unexpected from our Lord's followers. We would think that Jesus might say something. In our minds, our harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. Therefore, let the preachers preach more dynamic sermons. That's not what he said. Let committees make and meet and make great plans and let the people read books and attend conferences. Jesus didn't mention any of that. The church's primary response to the needs of the world can be summed up in one word, the first word of verse 38, pray. In the book of Acts, they prayed and fasted. In the modern church, we pray fast. And that's why it's so hard to see the harvest. The church is to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. We plead and pray and earnestly beseech the Lord of heaven to stir his people to become workers in the field. We, I'm about through, but stay with me just another moment. First we pray, then we meet. First we pray, then we sing. First we pray, then we preach. First we pray, then we give. First we pray, then we organize. First we pray, then we go. 
That's the plan. We pray the Lord of the harvest because all things, Paul said, are by him and through him and from him and for him. He knows where the seed needs to be planted. He knows when the harvest has come. He knows how many workers are needed. And he knows how we ought to pray. Lord, send forth labors into the harvest. We're to pray that God will light a fire. One of the things I'm praying for at our church as we prepare for our conference, and I'm sure your pastor and staff have prayed this way, I think missions conferences and missions emphasis are the greatest way in the world for a church to have real revival. Because what revival is, it's a awakening of God's people to what really needs to start happening that hasn't been happening. That's what it is. So we need to throw out, we need to throw out this couple to Japan. We need to throw out this couple to Canada. We need to throw out this couple to Sierra Leone and keep throwing them out. Throw out the lifeline, we used to sing. There's some wanderer that needs to come home. Cherry Street, you have, so, you have thrown out 18 families, and two in the wings is waiting. But you can do more. You ought to want to do more. If God can trust you to do that many, I think he could trust you to do a whole lot more. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth labors. This must be an earnest prayer. And can I tell you one more thing about the prayer? There must be a deepening of the spiritual life of the church so that men won't be able to stay at home that God wants to go. Now, I'm learning and growing. I, I don't know about you. I worry about Christians that have arrived. I'm still learning and growing. And in my learning and growing process, the more I try to get closer to the Lord, the more the burden grows heavier for what matters. And I found out in the ministry that God put me in, in pastoring a church, I found out I'm about as good a pastor to the people that I love as I am in my relationship to the Lord who is in charge of my life. And I think that's got to become paramount in everything that we think, everything that we do. The people who go to their knees to beg God for workers are often the very people God uses to answer his prayer about who will go. You say, are you telling me if I pray for missions or for a missionary, for laborers to go in the mission field, the Lord might call you? He might. I tell my grandkids all the time, I'd rather see you in the remotest part of the world in the will of God than in Columbia, South Carolina, out of it. Parents, you ought to pray that way for your kids. You ought to pray that way for the young people of this church. The question is, are we willing to pray? Lord, do things in me, in me, that I'm not used to. Luke 9, 38, we just read it and studied it. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, and I don't have my phone with me because I'd show it to you if I had it with me, but I've got two time saved in my phone 9 38 in the morning 9 38 at night you know what i'm doing i'm praying for the lord of the harvest to send forth more help to canada more help to japan and more help to the ends of the earth will you pray 
I want you to pray, Lord, what would you have us to do to share with faith promise? Your pastor is better at that than I am, but I believe in it, and we do it in our church, and he's helped me so much with it. But my emphasis, my emphasis to you is let's pray for the people that's going to need support that God raise up more people. Brother Dennis, I'm going to tell you, my brother, and I'll tell you, church, I want my young people to love the Lord more. I want them to even consider going to the field. But you know what breaks my heart? The best young people I have and have had, it seems like more than encouraging them to consider serving the Lord, in many cases, by their own parents, are discouraged to not do it. we got to change that somehow. I mean, I'm not a great Bible teacher or scholar, but I can tell you this. I have three wonderful children. They're all in our church. They're all serving the Lord in our church, along with their families. But you know what? They can't go to heaven on daddy's coattails. And they can't serve the Lord in a full-time basis on daddy's coattails. I don't even want them to. But I'll tell you what I do pray. I want them to want to. That's what I want. I want my grandkids to at least consider, Lord, what would you have me to do? Rather than, Lord, I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. And so tonight, if it'd be all right, and the pastor's going to close the service as he wants to, but I'm going to call you to pray. And I'm going to ask Pam if she'd just play on the piano something softly in a moment. Brother Dennis, if it's all right, I'd like to, if those who want to, could we just gather around and say, Lord, do something in my heart that I'm not used to, that makes me uncomfortable, but I know it's your will. And I know if I do that, then the giving and the living and the loving and the serving will take care of themselves. Would you stand with your heads bowed?